Hi, everyone. This is Dory Clark, and I am here with Newsweek as part of our weekly interview program, Better. I am here with Vivek Tiwari, who is a wonderful Tony-nominated Broadway producer. He is a lead producer of Jagged Little Pill, which until you know what, <laughs> was uh, was doing very well on, on Broadway. Vivek, I'm so glad to have you here. That's good. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. It's always fun to chat with you. Uh, thank you. So today we are going to be talking about how to become more resilient in both business and in life. And I, I think these days, probably no one knows that better than the Broadway community, which aside perhaps from cruise ships, has been devastated more than almost any other industry. I'd also like to take a moment to just welcome the folks who are here and tuning in. And so please go ahead and type into the chat box, say hi, let us know who you are so we can give a shout out to you. We're gonna be taking questions from the audience and we'd love to hear yours. So in fact, the first question that I have, I mean, let's let's start big. What, uh, what's happening with Broadway? You Hopefully uh, you are attending meetings, you know things that perhaps the rest of us don't. When realistically are we coming back and what do we need to know as uh, members of the broader community who love Broadway, who wanna see it come back strong? Um, you know, I mean, the, the most important thing I can ask you to do is, is just uh, keep paying attention and keep supporting. Uh, you know, we are uh, have said that we're coming back in June. Uh, my show is Jagged Little Pill, and and we are selling tickets from June first onwards. Uh, but as with everything these days, we are being nimble. I mean, that's something I that's a word that I I, I want to talk about in this interview. Um, everybody needs to be nimble. You need to be prepared for changes in the world. Um, we are very hopeful that we will be back. Uh, over the summer, as we have announced, um, but we are also preparing for every contingency. One thing I can say with 100% certainty is that we are coming back this year. Um, so what people can do is, is pay attention, keep supporting, buy tickets, um, and know that you'll be able to come back to your favorite shows before the year is out. I genuinely believe that. Um, and and yes, we are in aggressive conversations. We talk about this stuff daily, if not weekly. Uh, about every which way that we can come back as soon as possible, but but come back safely. You know, what we don't want to do is things we've seen some of our colleagues do in other parts of the world where uh, we've the curtains has risen and then we've come back and, and, and it's had to go down again. You know, that's what we don't want to do. We want to assure people that as soon as the curtain rises, we are back for good. And, uh, and as I said, I guarantee you that that's happening this year and we're, we are planning for it to happen as early as June. Well, fingers crossed. We definitely hope that that is the case. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank some of the folks who are tuning in here and are eager to hear your insights, Vivek. We have Rosinda from Mexico, uh, Nelia from Calgary. We have uh, Dr. Mohammed Solomon, our friend from New York and New Jersey, Jeannie from Oregon. Uh, we have, oh, we have Al uh, Nocciolino. I don't know if you actually know him. He is a great, uh, he's a great Broadway guy who brings uh, many shows to upstate New York. We're glad to have you here. Lisa from Atlanta, Louisa. Uh, this is awesome. We're so glad to have everyone here. Yeah, so the, a question that I have for you is, it, when you first heard that the curtain was going down, it's it's mid-March and all the shows are, uh, are going dark, originally the plan was a couple of weeks and then Broadway will be yeah. back on. What was going through your mind? And in those moments, you know, this is really a show about leadership in business and in life. As a leader, as one of the lead producers, what was going through your head and how did you think about conveying this news and keeping the team together in receiving this devastating news? Yeah, so so obviously it was a shock. You know, I think that we were woefully underprepared and or under um, informed uh, in this in this country, especially. You know, I don't think we really had the research or the intelligence individually to be able to realize that this wasn't going to be a few weeks, you know. So the first thing that was going through my head was to really try try to make sense of it, and and that's both emotional in terms of you know um, uh, sort of uh, you know putting on my armor and stealing myself for for some difficult days, but also professionally, you know, doing the research and figuring out you know what what, what does this mean? What what is this pandemic all about? What has this looked like in, in other countries? How have other countries that have had outbreaks before we've had dealt with it? both from a country perspective, as well as from a business and arts and entertainment perspective. So that's kind of what I did. I sort of got to work in both stealing myself and, and doing the research. 
And in terms of communication, one of the things that we have really um, striven to do with Jagged Little Pill and something I try to do with all my projects is just lean into transparency and honesty, you know, gather the entire cast and company and tell them like, look, here's what we know. And there's a lot that we don't know. I mean, uh, there there are some leaders who believe in you know don't say anything until you really know what have something to say, and I personally follow the opposite path. Um, I believe that it's better to say as much as you possibly can and just admit when you don't know something. Um, and I think especially in these pandemic days, um, I don't want to put words in in my cast and company's mouths, but I believe that they appreciated um, being able to to walk away and saying like I heard from my lead producer and you know what he he doesn't know either. Like, I think that was probably more comforting than being left in the dark. So that's really what we did. We tried to communicate as often as possible. Um, we were emailing regularly. And as soon as we got a grip on new technologies like Zoom and StreamYard, um, we set up weekly happy hours, we called them every Friday night for, for those who wanted to uh, to lift a drink and, and be together. But we also used those as opportunities to share whatever we knew so that there were weekly gatherings. You know, and we tried to do as much of those kinds of things as possible. Um, to keep uh, the the utmost of transparency while we were working hard um, to protect ourselves and to to do the research as to, to what was actually going on in the world. And it became quickly apparent that it wasn't going to be weeks, you know, and, and we tried and are continuing to try to communicate that as best we can to our cast and company to say, it's not going to be weeks, it's going to be months. Oh, it's not going to be months, it might be a year. And, you know, so so if you need to take other jobs, fill us in, let us help you get those other jobs. We care about you as human beings. We want you to be to, to be making income. We'll try to get jobs for you. You know, as you probably know, Jagged Little Pill, we did a variety of things. We did a live stream fundraiser for the Actors Fund. Uh, we recently did a, a live concert event with Stellar, a sort of reunion concert of sorts. We did a fundraiser for the Biden-Harris campaign. We've done all so sorts of things. And as many times as we could, we found ways to pay our cast and company to um, to appear at those things, certain things like the fundraiser for for the Biden Harris campaign were were volunteer uh, events. But as much as we can, we've also tried to find them work. So that's really what we've been doing is just working hard, not not going into a cave and shutting down, but confronting the situation head on with hard work and honesty. That's really powerful. Thank you for sharing that, Vivek. If you are enjoying this conversation, please hit the like button and also type in your questions to Vivek. We're going to be taking uh, yours and turning to them momentarily. So let us know what's on your mind. If you're interested in learning more about his work, you can go to Tuari, e -N -T, like entertainment.com. And also, of course, you can check out uh, Vivek's show, jaggedlittlepill.com. So Vivek, a question that came in from one of our viewers, which uh, I think is pr probably on a lot of people's minds. Uh, this person from LinkedIn wants to know, do you envision Broadway shows going hybrid in the next five or 10 years? I believe that probably means uh, having live as well as recorded video components uh, in order to maintain revenue and compensate for the lost revenue of COVID. What are your thoughts about recording? I mean, certainly uh, Hamilton on, uh, on uh, you know, Disney Plus raised a lot of awareness about these things. What is the future of recordings and how that ties in with live theater? Yeah, I, th I think that, uh, that business models are clearly changing and um, audiences are changing with what they, uh, what they are comfortable doing. And I, I believe that you know, things like live stream and live captures, um, what, what's most exciting to me about it is I think we are reaching a place now where um, both audiences and creatives are beginning to think of this not as a stopgap, not as a way, um, you know, to address your question, not as a way to get revenue um, when we have been losing revenue, but as really as a new art form, you know, to, to really embrace the medium as its own medium. Um, and, and that's honestly where I think Broadway shows are heading. I think it, I think it's going to be in the next five or 10 years, you know, as the world returns to, to whatever the new normal is, I think it will be less of a, of a hybrid, meaning like you can, you know, watch it online on these days and in this way, and you can watch it in the theater on these days and in this way, less of that kind of a hybrid and more sort of as a, as another creative outlet in the way that a show like Hamilton can have a live stream on Disney plus, as well as a, a live show once it returns, um, you know, Jagged Little Pill, we are planning a variety of those kind of things as well, but but less for for revenue purposes and and certainly for that as well. Um, we we are in we are com I'm a commercial producer. I want to make money, but but more um, 
to engage creatively, to engage our fans in a number of different creative ways, to have Diablo Cody, our writer, use her creative brain in a lot of different ways. You know, we we scripted the concert that with the live uh, concert that we did with Stellar, um, and uh, and that was I think fun for Diablo to to use her creative talents as a writer in a medium that she hadn't worked in before. Um, so we are trying to do a lot of those kind of things, and that's what I really see happening in the future. I, I, I see both creative and audiences embracing these new technologies and these new mediums um, for consuming the, the, the entertainment that they love, um, leading to new creative opportunities so that what you're seeing in your live stream is, is different. The experience is different um, from what you're getting on stage. And it's not a replacement. It's, it's, a, it's a compliment. Yeah, that's that's great, and I, I think very hopeful because the more we can be expanding the audience, uh, the more the more powerful it is. M I think probably much like TED, uh, which ended up not cannibalizing its its yeah. conference, but growing the base and growing the awareness by making the talks accessible. So that's that's, that's awesome. Right. That's right, and you know, it's it's every show is different, and I do want to want to say that as well. You know, Hamilton did very successfully with, with its Disney Plus streaming, but not every show is Hamilton. You know, I think uh, I think it's very clear that Hamilton, um, you know, is a uh, you know became a, a, a moment of cultural zeitgeist. And you know, people. There were many people who simply couldn't get a ticket to see Hamilton, and so they went and saw it on Disney Plus. And there's still something to seeing it live, and so people will go and see it live. You know, it's it's. Uh, but there are other shows for which you know, if people once tourism returns and they come back to New York City and they're there for three days and they can only take in one Broadway show, you know, if they've already seen your show on live stream, maybe your show, if you're not Hamilton, isn't going to be the one that they pick. So, so I do also want to encourage fans out there and fellow producers out there um, to to not real to realize that all shows are different, you know, and and uh, so you have to to do what's what's best for your show, um, and and really think about that thoughtfully, both as a fan um, as well as as a producer of entertainment. Yeah, it's a really important point, Vivek. And as someone who personally is a Broadway investor and also uh, writes, you know, like as you do, uh, I'm a member of the BMI Layman Engel Musical Theater Workshop. Uh, these are really important questions to be uh, to be talking about. So thank you for all this. We had a great question come in from Andrew, who actually himself is a LinkedIn editor. Appropriately enough, um, since so many unfortunately uh, Broadway performers are out of work, Andrew writes a great weekly newsletter uh, and articles around around the job search process. But he wants to know, um, do you think that Broadway shows might come back in the spring or summer at outdoor spaces? Is that possibly uh, something that might that might be happening? What What's your thought, Vivek? Yeah, so I mean, the, the short answer to your question, you know, do, do you see a chance for this um, is yes, in the sense that and when we are talking about these kind of things all the time, um, you know, you may remember that, you know, when the pandemic uh, first uh, hit and people were brought into lockdown that drive-ins um, were making a bit of a resurgence and that we had a lot of conversations about what we could do at drive-ins. Um, so, so that is the short answer to your question is that yes, we are talking about that kind of thing all the time. The longer answer to your question is it is very complicated to put up and stage a Broadway show. Um, you know, when, when you pick a theater, a venue for your show, there are a lot of considerations. Lighting design, where are you gonna hang your lights? Um, geography of stage plots. Some shows require more little physical stage space than others because they have larger ensembles and bigger dance numbers. Um, there are certain limitations for stage set. You know, you can't just take your stage set and, and lump it in any venue because it's built for, the, it may have been built for the specific theater that you were in. So all of this is a long-winded way of saying that even if it becomes immediately possible to do a show in an outdoor venue, it might logistically not be possible to just take whatever you've got and, and, and put it up. Um, and the cost of rejigging your show to make to make it work in that outdoor venue might also not make financial sense. So I'm getting into kind of the business nitty gritty of it all. Um, so I guess what where I'm going with all that is um, is what is what you may mo more likely see is more shows doing. Um, and this goes back to the answer I was just giving about a, a different creative piece of work. You know, uh, if you can't come back on on your Broadway stage, but there's an opportunity to do something in an outdoor venue. Maybe it's not the show, but maybe you gather your creative team together. You know, we'll get Diane Paulus and Diablo Cody and Tom Kitt and City Larby, our choreographer, and get them all together and say, what can we do in this outdoor venue? We can't quite do the entire show, 
let's get Ricardo Hernandez, our, our set designer, to, to, to suggest what he can redesign for this. And let's figure something else out that is a taste of the show. Maybe it's one part concert experience, one part Broadway show. It's a little bit narrative, but it doesn't give away the whole story. So people will still want to come and see it. What cool creative thing can we do in this outdoor venue that can be really fun for fans and give you that experience of seeing a great outdoor summer concert and a great Broadway show, but not ruin or cannibalize our chances for people who haven't seen the show when we want to come back and deliver the full experience. You know, like that that's more what I think is likely for to see happening over the summer if we are not returning in full force uh, inside the, the Broadway houses. I, I think that's a great point, Vivek, because ultimately new situations engender new creative responses. And so it can actually create right. its own hybrid art form in some okay. ways. So fantastic. On the theme of resilience, which is uh, one of the pieces undergirding our conversation today, Anna had a great question. She wanted to know, oh, no, sorry, we have somebody praising Anna's question. That's very nice. <laughs> but additionally, Anna's actual question is for you personally, where do you get your inspiration? How do you keep your motivation up? I mean, obviously, as a Broadway producer, this is, this is probably the hardest time in history to be a Broadway producer. How have you been able personally to stay resilient during this time period? Yeah. So look, I, for me, I think that the most important thing that you can do at any period in your life, but certainly in the past year, is to really take a step back and focus in on identifying and exploiting the things that you love most in your life, the things that you are most passionate about. Um, you know, and and that's really has been the key to my resilience, if you will, is uh, is and and that's been really useful. And I and I like to think that when the world returns or comes back to what I describe will be the new normal, that I'll take some of those habits that I've learned um, this past year into that new normal. Um, and what I mean about focusing on what you're passionate about, I mean that both personally and professionally. So personally, for example, like I'm, I'm really passionate about my family. I love spending time with my wife and kids. So I realized like, if that's something I'm really passionate about, how can I take advantage of that in the pandemic? You know, we can, and when things were on lockdown, that meant we went for more hikes together and we got out into nature and, and that was really lovely. And when things started to open up a little bit and the nearby ice skating rink opened, we picked up ice skating. Um, and uh, and shockingly, people were respecting social distance and, and being masked uh, in that rink. Um, you know, and so I started doing things like that. And, and professionally, um, what I love personally as a producer is I love collaborating with musicians, with musical artists. Uh, you can see that's pretty obvious if you look at my work. My recent show is Jagged Little Pill with Alanis Morissette. My, one of my last shows was American Idiot with Green Day. I wrote a graphic novel called The Fifth Beatle that we're adapting for television, and that's working with the Beatles music catalog. Um, so that's what I'm most passionate about, is I love working with um, celebrity musicians, if you will, uh, my, my, my musical heroes. And you know what? Like this past year, many of those musical heroes, you know what they were doing? They were stuck at home. You know, they were more than happy to have a conversation with me about developing a new show. And so, you know, literally last year, I put together a slate of nine projects. I'm entering 2021 with nine projects in development that are all tied to what I call high profile music. And, and, and that's because I identified that what I love most about what I'm doing is talking to musicians and musicians have time to talk. <laughs> so, so I leaned into that. So, so I guess, you know, that's a long winded answer to your question is I think like use this time to identify what you're most passionate about and figure out how given the parameters of this new world that we live in, you can best do those things that you're most passionate about. And if you're focusing on doing the things you love, you're also taking care of your anxiety. Like it's, it's not a, you know, my, my wife is an anxiety researcher and she'll tell you um, one of the key things about, about dealing with anxiety is focusing on the positive. You know, just don't think about the negative things in your life, focus on the positive things. So what are the positive ramifications of this? Well, I could spend more time with my family and musicians are easier to get on the phone. You know, so, so that, that's kind of, um, I think the key um, to both being resilient and being a good producer in this time. Um, and, you know, for shows that are already up and running, you know, I talked a lot about development, but for Jagged Little Pill, you know, what we did is we put our creative brains together and thought about, again, what can we do in this time that we couldn't do before? Okay, so all of a sudden people are comfortable with Zoom technologies. So let's do some live stream events. 
you know, we started doing that. We put together a paid live stream concert that fans had to buy a ticket for. So it brought some income to, to my my cast and my company who who were on it, who needed the money because they were largely unemployed. We also, you know, had a charitable angle to it. So we were also doing good work. Um, and that was, you know, so we found a, a way to do that. And Jagged Little Pill is a show that also has a lot of social conscience. You know, we are a show that I don't consider it an activist show, but we hope that people will see it and leave inspired to change the world. You know, wh whether that's their own little world uh, and, you know, have a difficult conversation with somebody in their in their life that's struggling with something that they might be able to help with. Or if you're struggling with some some something going out and seeking help, we hope that's a message of our show. Or maybe it's getting involved in a nonprofit cause that you believe in. We hope that people will do that when they walk out of the theater. That's what we had long hoped when there was a theater to walk out of. So we thought about, OK, well, there's no theater to walk out of with that inspiration. So how can we deliver that in other ways? So, you know, we politically uh, aligned ourselves with um, with the Biden Harris campaign and we decided to do a fundraiser for them. That was something we could do, you know, and, and we found other ways of supporting the various causes that we believed in and hopefully would inspire, you know, our fans and our our extended family to do the same thing. You know, and those were all things that we may not have been able to do um, had there not been a pandemic. So that's what we did. We focused on 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 what we cared about most and 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 what new opportunities did this world present um, to lean into those things that we cared about the most. Um, I love that. Yeah. That's so good, Vivek. Great insights. And if you want to learn more about Vivek and his work, his nine projects that he's cooking up, go to his <laughs> website uh, right here, tawarient.com. If you want to make sure that you never miss one of our weekly interview series for Newsweek, you can actually subscribe to my LinkedIn newsletter, and that will enable you to get reminders about the great guests that are coming through. Just go to doryclark.com slash LinkedIn, hit the subscribe button, and you will you will be fully briefed on all of this. So a great question came in, Vivek, uh, from Lisa. She was actually curious, given how hard things have been for performers in the past year, what would you tell an aspiring performer right now? What should they be learning or thinking or doing? They're, obviously, they're uh, staring into an industry where the job prospects right at the moment are not fantastic. How would you think about this for someone who is intending to break into the industry? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the the main piece of advice that I always give people, which which certainly hasn't changed, and, and I spent the last question talking probably a little too long about it, is, is focus on what you're passionate about. So that 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 should be be general advice for any given moment in time is is for any aspiring performer. What what is the type of performance you're most passionate about? What is it singing, dancing, acting? You know, what 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 is it that you most want to do with your life? Um, and and then uh, you know, I used this word earlier in our conversation, be nimble. You know, and 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 um, maybe I'm being very dorky and academic and and semantic here, but people talk a lot about pivoting, and 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 I'm not talking about pivoting. I'm talking about being nimble, and what that means is finding every way you possibly can to pursue your passion. Uh, and that is, you know, if you say like, well, if your passion is like, you know, I want to be on Broadway, like, okay, well, we'll hone into that a little bit more. Does it really need to be on Broadway, or is it that you want to want to be a, uh, you know, a, a, a musical? Is it you want to sing and dance? And if it's that you want to sing and dance, maybe there are ways to accomplish that in this world that we live in right now through a live stream. Maybe it's getting together with a bunch of your friends and putting on your own show, or you know, if, if you're in lockdown with your brothers and sisters uh, in your basement, you know. Like and then when the world opens up a little bit, maybe you can write a very creative show that can be uh, performed and done in a socially distanced way, and and record that with your buddies in your backyard. Um, you know, so so it's about you know I guess I, I'm honing in on on figuring out what you love, being nimble in how you um, you you pursue that, and doing it yourself. You know, don't just say, okay, bro I want to be a Broadway performer, Broadway's closed, so that sucks, so I just need to wait around until Broadway reopens. You know, instead, figure out what exactly is it that you love, and how can I do that myself? How can I not wait around for somebody to give me a gig, but how can I put the show up on my own? Um, you know, and, and if you're not a producer or a writer or a performer, and you're like, I, I can't just put up a show on my own, find people in your network who are and collaborate with them because they're probably feeling the same way you are. They're also probably feeling stilted in, in what they love doing. Um, so, and, and then the last piece of advice, which is so cheesy and I'm sure people have said it a million times, is just don't give up. 
You know, it is a hard industry, the arts and entertainment industries that we work in. I, I personally believe it's one of the hardest, but it's also one of the most rewarding and one of the most inspiring. And, and I genuinely believe that no dream is too impossible and no person too unlikely to realize that dream. Uh, but I also believe that, you know, the the wilder your dreams are, so to speak, the harder you're going to have to work. So so please just push through it and, and don't give up. You know, know that you can achieve your dreams and don't let anyone tell you it's impossible. But just know that you're going to go through tough patches. I mean, I, I'm very proud that I've been very successful um, in my uh, my company's 21 years old. I'm very proud of that. But I tell you what, every two or three years we go through a patch where where things are hard, and and uh, and and you know, I'm I'm and I'm not thrilled about the current state of things in my my uh, under behind my corporate doors, and uh, and I go through that every few years. But I remind myself, like that's that's the industry we work in. There are ups and downs, and you push through the hard times, you get through it, and and you will get to accomplish those dreams. I really believe that. Absolutely. I, I think that's really useful advice. And thank you for that. Last call, folks, for your questions for Vivek. We want to take them. If you've been enjoying this conversation, hit the like button and hit the share button so that your friends and colleagues can benefit from Vivek's insights as well. And a question came in from Dublin, Vivek. Uh, our friend Joseph wants to know, could VR actually be the future of theater? Uh, do you think it's worth exploring or maybe even investing in? What is your perspective yeah. on VR? So you've asked two questions here, and and the la the the second question um, is it worth exploring and or investing in is absolutely one hundred percent. The first question was is it the future of theater, and I would say absolutely not. Um, you know we've talked about this a little bit on this on this uh, on this uh, this chat already. As I said, um, you know I view these new technologies as extensions. It's not the future of theater. It's not that theater is going to be replaced with VR. But um, you know, one of one of I think the silver linings from the pandemic is people have been forced to embrace using technology. Um, so VR is just another technology. And what excites me the most is when can we do something with? Let's talk about my current show, Jagged Little Pill, in the VR world. That's not a replacement, but that's complementary. And I don't know what that is. Maybe that's going to be a VR show that will explore backstories of the characters. You know, there it's a, there's an ensemble that's very rich with story, and there are minor characters whose backstories we don't get to see. So maybe we'll do a VR experience for that. Or maybe we can do, you know, it's a, a Jagged Little Pill is a family um, story. So maybe we can do a VR experience that allows you to enter um, Steve's uh, workroom and um, Frankie's bedroom where she um, comes up with her activist posters and, and, and defines the things that she's passionate about. And we can explore the various spaces of our characters. Like, so, so I think it is, it, VR is absolutely something that's going to be very exciting um, to explore in the theatrical world. And it's, it's definitely worth investing in. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of thinking about VR myself, but is it the future of theater? If, 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 if what you mean by that question is, is it going to replace theater? There's no chance of it. Um, that, that's what I believe. But it will be a future of theater. How about that? It will be one of our futures. That makes a lot of sense. So Vivek, we have time probably for just one more question. One thing that I am curious about, you mentioned earlier, you have nine different projects that you were working on going into 2021. Obviously there, there are a world of possibilities. I'm curious, and I think uh, probably many of our colleagues who are here on the call are as well. How do you pick your projects? What what is it that captures your attention? And you know, when you are drilling down and saying, "Okay, I'm going to put my time and energy into moving this forward," which is not easy. How are you actually sifting and selecting where mm -hmm. you're putting your energy? Yeah. So you know, another thing that I that I did during the pandemic uh, is that, um, and it, it, this sort of ties into just the answer to some of the previous questions, is honing in on, on what I love the most. You know, is it, forced me to sort of really hone in on what it is that I do and what is it that I love doing. And uh, you know, the the dorky academic semantic you can tell that I'm that kind of guy that I came up with is what I do is I collaborate with the music industry and celebrity musicians and composers to transform high profile music into narrative entertainment. That's what I do. So I work with bands and composers and catalogs and albums that you would have heard of. 
personally, I love new artists. I love it when a, when a buddy of mine says, I heard this new band, you gotta check them out. I'm the first person to pick up the album or run to Spotify or when, when the world was different, go see a show. Um, I love discovering new music. I love new composers for the stage. I love hearing about a, a new musical that's taking place downtown with a new composer that I've never heard of. I support that work. I don't produce it. That's just not what I do. What I do is I collaborate with Alanis Morissette and Green Day and the and the various estates of the Beatles. And like, that's what I do and what I'm passionate about in my commercial life, in my professional life. My personal life, I'm all over new stuff. My my professional life, I collaborate with, with well-known music, high profile music. So that's the first filter is that, that you know, I look for those kinds of projects. And, and as you can tell, I'm a guy that follows my passion. So which high profile musicians, catalogs, albums am I passionate about? So that's that's the first thing. And the second part of that is, is transforming that high profile music into narrative entertainment. And what does narrative entertainment mean? Well, it means story driven entertainment. I'm a story guy, I love story. Um, you know, I, I'm, I will never say never, but I don't really do bios, um, you know, and there have been a number of very good ones, Jersey Boys, Beautiful. There's a number of, of shows that have been produced by my colleagues that, that, I, that, again, I love to watch, but it's not what I do professionally. You know, Alanis uh, has, has spoken very publicly saying that, you know, I was not the first producer that approached her wanting to do something with Jagged Little Pill, but she also has said that I am the first person who approached her and said in the first breath, you've lived an inspiring life, but I don't want to use Jagged to tell your life story. I want to come up with something new and fresh and original and honor the legacy of the album, which is about confronting difficult truths. And let's find an amazing writer to figure out what that story is. Somebody like Diablo Cody, you know, like that was my take on it. So that's how I operate is like, I, I don't lean into pre-existing stories or biographies. I want to come up with something new and fresh. Like that is what excites me. And, uh, and the reason narrative entertainment isn't just musical is because musicals um, have a connotation of the stage. And while I am best known for my Broadway work, certainly, um, you know, I am developing extensively for television. Uh, there, you'll see a few announcements uh, coming um, soon uh, regarding to our end projects that are, are entertain that are television related. Fifth Beetle is one of them. We've already announced we're doing Fifth Beetle at television. Um, and I have some film things in the works as well. And this year I, I added live stream producer to my to my skill set and something I never thought I would say. Uh, so that's why, you know, that's why I say narrative entertainment instead of just musical to, because that leaves it more open to any medium. So, so I, I put that for that dorky framework around what I do and, uh, and then I apply it to, to finding creative partners that I love, like what band and our high profile music do I love? And how can I pair that with a writer who can tell a story that I might love? And then th that's how I'll pick my projects so important to have a clear filter to know what you want to be doing so sure. you can focus yeah. accordingly. That's great. Vivek Tiwari, we are so glad to have you here. If you want to learn more about Vivek and his work, his nine projects uh, that are happening right now, go to his website, Tiwari ENT. And also you can, of course, the minute it is back, check out his Broadway show, Jagged Little Pill. If you want to make sure you never miss a Newsweek weekly interview series uh, that we're doing here for The Better Show, go to doryclark.com. You can subscribe to my email list there. Vivek, thank you so much for having us and, and being part having of this. Me. I really appreciate it. And, um, and I will just say that uh, regarding the nine projects that are coming, if I can be self-promotional for a moment, we haven't announced most of them. So, so uh, come to the website and join our mailing list. And uh, in the next few months, we'll be making those announcements. And and similar as you know, as we have done during the pandemic, there's going to be a lot of interesting things happening for Jagged Little Pill as well. So certainly, don't wait around until we're back. You'll you'll see in the next coming months uh, 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 several things that you'll be able to attend um, or join for uh, for Jagged Little Pill. So we're, we've got some interesting things cooking there as well. Um, and whatever it is that you're passionate about there about, you know, please, please uh, be resilient and, and take care of yourself. Um, the last thing I, I did want to say that I didn't get a chance to earlier is it's okay to take those moments to not be resilient. You know, I think it's okay to, to go into the, the back room and, and break down a little bit, but then just pick yourself up and, and keep moving forward. You know, uh, 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 there, there is a light at the end of this tunnel. And thank you for joining us today to talk about it. Thank you so much, Vivek, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We'll see you next week.